Good morning, everybody. You are on behalf of WIT. I'd like to welcome you to uh, this uh, talk, this opportunity for you to hear uh, Tommy Reichenhall, uh, who is one of the only, uh, one of the few hundreds of Holocaust survivors who are still alive in the world today. So I'd like to welcome Tony, Tommy to welcome back Tommy to WIT. <laughs> He was here about seven or eight years ago, if I can remember correctly. And I'd also like to welcome his partner, Joyce, to uh, WIT. It's her first time here. So both of you are extremely welcome. And this is a very important occasion. The size of the crowd here is saying that. And as all of you know, especially those of you who are studying history or have studied history, the World War, World War II ended 70 years ago, and that has been celebrated this year, as well as the beginning of World War I. And we seem to be always talking about wars. Um, but, uh, and I'm just going to say very, very little here, uh, that I, when I was a student, I used to work in Germany and uh, near Munich, and uh, near Munich is the concentration camp of Dachau, uh, it's a smaller one compared to Auschwitz and some of the other ones, but nonetheless the same brutality went on there as in the uh, Auschwitz or Bergen-Belsen. Um, and one of the uh, mottos or phrases, there's this famous one called Arbeit macht frei, which work will make you free, which in the con in a normal context is fine, but in the context of a concentration camp is a totally different meaning. The other, uh, uh, the D Dachau concentration camp now is a memorial to all the survivors. And the thing that struck me there, it's a very emotional place, but also that as you go into the memorial itself, after you've walked under the gate that says Arbeit macht frei, or work makes you free, there is a, a phrase, a, a, proverb, a shanukal, if you even want to put it that way, uh, and I'll translate it into English, and it translates as something like, those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And that's something that we need all remember, and know our past, and be able to say what was good and what was bad about it. What drove, us to, what drove the people in the past to do that sort of thing? And why did they do that, and why didn't they do something else? These are questions that we have to answer, not the people that are dead. So that's, in that context, this talk this, uh, this morning by Tommy is so important for us all. Just a, a small bit on Tommy then. Uh, he was born in 1935 in Slovakia. Uh, when he was just nine years old, he was taken with members of his family to the Nazi concentration camp of Bergen-Belsen. He survived the experience and in 1959 came to live in Dublin, where he lived with his wife and raised three sons. For almost 60 years, Tommy was unable to speak about his experience in Bergen-Belsen. He now dedicates his time to raising awareness about the Holocaust and gives many talks in schools every year about his experiences, just like he's doing today. This talk, however, will be, it is a public talk, as you see, uh, and, uh, he published his autobiography into, uh, about three years ago, four years ago actually, 2011. Uh, it's called I Was a Boy in Belson. A film was made of the same name about his life. And last year, a documentary which was broadcast on RTE called Close to Evil uh, was made about the search for one of his former jailers. I should say as well that this talk has been organized by the Religious Studies and Theology Group at WIT and also uh, in association with Holocaust Education Trust Ireland. So uh, before Tommy uh, begins his presentation, uh, I'll ask Colette Colfer, lecturer in Religious Studies here, to uh, address you for a couple of moments. 
Okay, I just want to say a few thank yous um, for this talk. So many people have been involved in the organisation of it. Also, I want to point out to you the fire exits. So you have one exit here and exits all along the back of the chapel. The talk is going to be streamed live online, so just you need all to, all, all to be aware of that. Um, so it's also going to be recorded and is likely to put up, be put up on the WIT website. So just have to make sure that you know that. If you could all turn off your mobile phones or put them on silent, invariably somebody's will go off anyway, but um, just to say that. Um, so I just want to thank some people, the porters, Eddie, Peter, Mark, Mark and Arthur, Kieran Boyle in Estates, the technical people, Keen, Owen, Damien, Martin, Michael, John and Jimmy, Oliver O'Connor in marketing, Hannah, Dorothy and everyone in the Humanities Office, the students who are helping today, Mary, Bernadette, Wendy, Katie and anybody else who I've missed, Sue as well. Uh, the Holocaust Education Trust of Ireland, who do extraordinary work. They have produced the booklets that most of you have in your hands. And um, for the teachers and lecture lecturers amongst you, they run absolutely world-class courses on uh, Holocaust education. So I advise anybody interested in getting in touch with them. Um, thanks to Philip Kremen and Paul Plaher on the Religious Studies and Theology Research Group. And just to remind people that Religious Studies and Theology is available to study here on the Bachelor of Arts and Bachelor of Arts in Psychology as a major or minor. Thank you to all of you for coming. It is absolutely fantastic that this level of interest is here in, in hearing Tommy speak. Um, so I really appreciate the effort that people have made to come here today. Unfortunately, the room is full, so there are some people in other classrooms who are listening to streaming live, so apologies, but we did not envisage this level of interest, but we are delighted at the same time. Um, finally, thanks to Joyce for accompanying Tommy and thanks for coming down today, Joyce. And Tommy, it is absolutely fantastic that Tommy is here today, but I also want to thank him not just for coming here today, but for being brave enough to speak about a very dark period in his life and for having the bravery to continue to go around and do these talks and, most importantly, I think, for keeping his heart open. So thank you very much and thanks, Tommy. Uh, good morning. I will sit later on, but I just want to all welcome you. It's a, a great honor to me to see so many people uh, interested in, in my story. Uh, I'd like to, of course, thank to Colette for organizing it and inviting me. I'm here the second or third time now. And it's a great privilege that I get that people invite me to school. I, I speak every week for the past uh, uh, nearly 12 years in school uh, to young people. It is very important for me uh, because uh, I think I owe it to the victims that their memory is not forgotten. And when I'm speaking to young people, uh, they tell the parents, uh, their friends, and maybe uh, their uh, children as well, and their children as well. So uh, we will keep the memory of the Holocaust for generation to come, especially that there are people already today that are trying to deny that uh, Holocaust even happened. In the next 10, 15 years, none of us will be here. And the people that I spoke to, if ever anybody will come to them and say, you know, the Holocaust is only a a Jewish propaganda, it never happened. At least you will be able to say no, because you actually met somebody that was there. And that's what is so important when I speak. And as I said, it's a great privilege that I'm being invited. I'm now booked up till end of the years, and I travel uh, all over the world. I was several times in the state uh, in England, Germany, Slovakia. I'm going in a couple of weeks to South Africa, speaking to young people and uh, reminding them what Holocaust was about. Usually people talking about the tragedy that happened during the Holocaust, but not many speak about the survivor. And that's, that's what I'm doing, uh, speaking about survival during uh, this uh, period. I, here in Ireland, I spoke to over 500 uh, 
50 schools, over 70,000 students. So it's a great uh, credit uh, that I uh, had the opportunity and uh, uh, that I was invited, in fact, to do that. For my effort of uh, speaking uh, uh, to young people and talking about the Holocaust, two years ago, I was awarded the Order of Merit uh, by the uh, Federal Republic of, uh, President of the Federal Republic of Germany, Joachim Gauck, which is a great honor, and I'm very proud of it. That's a pin that I uh, wear very proudly every day. But also I got a certificate which is signed by the president and also a medal, a cross that I'm allowed to wear um, to state occasion. I'm waiting for an invitation. <laughs> but um, uh, as a Holocaust survivor, getting order of merit from uh, the president of Germany is something when you think about it that not long ago we're talking about 70 years. 70 years is not such a long time. I was uh, incarcerated by the German and uh, now I got from a German president an uh, uh, order of merit, which is the highest honor that the German government can give to anybody. So it's a great uh, uh, honor to get this. Uh, I, my lecture uh, lasts about uh, one hour, 15, 20. I speak first about my childhood in Slovakia and then about my incarceration in Belgian Belsen. So without any more ado, I just perhaps, uh, um, uh, um, uh, I perhaps just um, introduce myself again. My name is uh, Tommy Reichenthal. I was born in Slovakia. I'm living in Ireland over 50 years. Uh, of course, I'm a Holocaust survivor and I'm Jewish. So without any more ado, I will start the lecture. I sit because it is over an hour and afterwards we will have uh, time for question and answer. And, uh, I would encourage to ask because it's a great opportunity to... Uh, there are not many of us left, so if you have any questions, I will be delighted to answer them. And then afterwards, if anybody purchased the book, I will dedicate it uh, to anybody. Okay. <clears throat> we must understand that the Holocaust is not only about uh, six million Jews that perish. The Holocaust is about racism, loss of freedom, loss of dignity, humiliation, loss of education, confiscation of property, enslavement, starvation, torture, mass execution, and of course the final uh, solution to the Jewish question, which was decided on the 28th of January 1942 at the Wannsee Conference. There were 12 high-ranking officers sitting at a table uh, having a, a five-course dinner with best brandy and cigar, and within less than two hours, they decided the fate of the uh, entire Jewish population of Europe. Among them, uh, 4,000 Jews in Ireland. Uh, thankfully, the German never reached Ireland. Uh, but because I'm a survivor, I speak about the survival. Uh, I was born in Slovakia. We lived in a small village about uh, 80 kilometers from Bratislava. It was a farming community. My father was a farmer and my grandfather had the village shop. Uh, we were very much like in, in the village. We were integrated. Uh, I have very fond memory from the village. Uh, they were good people. The kids used to come to our farm and we used to play. If anybody needed any advice, they always said, go to the Reichenthal. They will be able to advise you. Whether they needed a good doctor or lawyer, uh, my grandfather or my father would, would advise them. Uh, my grandfather, of course, had the village shop, so he knew everybody, everybody knew him. Any event in the village, uh, whether it was wedding or funeral, uh, 
my parents were always invited, so we were integrated in the village. In fact, when I researched my book, I found out that already in late 1700, we lived in Slovakia, so probably we lived there even before. So we considered ourselves Slovak. We did not know any other country. We were Slovak. My father was in the Slovak army. One of my uncle was one of the first pilots in the Slovak Air Force. But all this uh, began to uh, change in 1939 when Germany invaded uh, the Czech Republic, they annexed Sudetenland, and they also imposed the puppet government in Slovakia. The president of uh, Slovakia at the time was a Roman Catholic priest. His name was Joseph Tiso. He was a big anti-Semite, and he befriended the Nazi regime in Germany. And because of the friendship between Slovakia and Germany, in fact, while the rest of Europe was being occupied by Germany, Slovakia, in fact, was not occupied by Germany, only late in uh, 1944. The cooperation between Slovakia and Germany was uh, very well uh, uh, organized. And Slovakia even joined the Japanese-German axis, which meant when any time Germany needed help, Slovakia would help, and vice versa. Of course, when the war broke out on the Polish border, Slovakia served the German very well, because through Slovakia, they transported the ammunition, the heavy equipment, tanks and guns, and also uh, many of the soldiers were being transported through Slovakia on the Slovak railways. The German paid for this, which was very useful for the Slovak economy because at the time Slovakia did not have much of an industry. Also, many Slovak uh, went and worked in Germany as volunteers to help with the war effort. It is estimated that over 100,000 young men and women worked in Germany uh, in the ammunition factories, in engineering concern, helping German in the war effort. Again, these people sent their money home, and that's again helped the uh, Slovak economy. But with this cooperation, also there was pressure by the German uh, on Slovakia against the Jews, and it didn't take long uh, when the Slovak government, government introduced the first uh, racial laws in Slovakia. It was on the September 1941. It was called the Jewish Codex. It had about 270 paragraphs, all restricting the life of the Jews. I'm only going to mention uh, several of them. First of all, we had to wear a yellow star any time we left our house. Uh, we were not allowed to go to any public places like cinema, theatre, swimming pool, public parks. We were not allowed to go to national school. And there were also uh, some uh, uh, silly uh, uh, restriction like Jewish people were not allowed to ride a bike or drive a, a car and uh, we were slowly being ostracized uh, from the Slovak uh, 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 community. I have here a page from a Slovak newspaper, it's people's newspaper, it is dated Bratislava 21st of September 1941, just after the Jewish Codex was introduced, and I'm going to read you a couple of the headlines at the time. Our laws are exemplary for the whole of Europe. Last all for the Jews. The strict racial law against Jews are Slovak. In certain aspects, the Slovak anti-Jewish laws are stricter than, than the German ones. They're referring, of course, to the Nuremberg laws. So the Slovaks were actually proud what they did against the old citizen. Uh, as I said, we lived uh, in Slovakia for generations, and suddenly 
we found our, ourselves stranger in our, in our own land. You can see here a caricature which uh, signifies, uh, you see a book, uh, a Jewish looking up, and uh, uh, Jews are falling out, signifying that the legal law no longer covered the Jews. So you can imagine after headline like this, many synagogues were born down, Jewish people were beaten up on the street, property, Jewish property was being damaged, and yet they couldn't complain to the police because, of course, the law did not cover us. There was even a couple of uh, fatality. Slogans were being written on Jewish businesses not to buy them because they belonged to the Jews. So the life of Jewish people began to deteriorate. Of course, in the village, I did not know anything because uh, for the simple reason that my parents didn't tell me. At the time, in 1941, I was six years old. I started the school in the village, but of course when it was a national school and once the laws came out, the Jewish codex, I was kicked out and I had to go uh, to the neighboring town where there was, uh, it was called Nitra, uh, there were about 5,000 Jews lived there, so <clears throat> they had several uh, Jewish schools, so I had to go there. And <clears throat> as I said, I didn't know anything about it because uh, my parents never told me, they didn't want it to frighten me. I didn't wear the yellow star in the village because Everybody knew us anywhere. There was no police, so nobody could enforce the law. So I didn't know anything. At the time, a six-year-old was very innocent. Today, a six-year-old, with the television, with internet, newspaper, etc., radio. At the time, if somebody had radio, he was considered a middle class. We, we didn't have any of these things. There was no newspaper. In actual fact, the propaganda, especially in the rural area, was spread through the churches. And in the churches, they would uh, preach in, in the masses that everything that's wrong in Slovakia is the fault of the Jew. When the the harvest wasn't good. They said it was the fault of the Jews. So when I come to uh, the, the uh, town, uh, for the first time I had to wear the yellow star. And as, as I said uh, at the time, uh, today a six-year-old, uh, he not only knows what is happening in Ireland, he knows what is happening all over the world. I didn't know anything beyond the village, so I didn't know anything that was happening. So when I came to town and my uh, aunt was sewing the yellow star, which I had to wear because the Jewish people lived in a certain part of the, the town, so the uh, community hall, the synagogue, the school was all very near. So my aunt was sewing the star, it was about this size, about 10 centimeter diameter. We had to wear it on the uh, left side. I asked, what is that for? And my aunt said, it's nothing, we are Jewish and we had to wear it. Because there, of course, the police was everywhere because of the Jewish area. And if you uh, come out without a yellow star, you would be arrested and fined very severely. So I, I didn't even ask, I had to wear the yellow star, it didn't bother me. She went with me a couple of times because the school was only about two, three hundred yards from our house. And after which she said, you know where the school is, you can go on your own. And that was the first time that I realized I am different to the other children because when I saw children, coming opposite me, without a yellow star, they suddenly started to shout at me, you dirty Jew, you smelly Jew, and all kind of insult that I can't even mention. And then this time they become more aggressive, they would start to spit at me, throwing stone after me. So I used to run to the school every morning and back from the school, and when I saw any children without a yellow star, I would run to the other side of the street so that they 
don't catch me. They, of course, did a couple of times. They gave me a couple of kicks in my backside and let me go. They were not much bigger than me, but they were sort of in group. And I used to come home. I used to cry to my aunt that I don't want to go to school. I'm being uh, insulted and, and um, uh, they're trying to beat me up. They were throwing stones behind me. But it wasn't an option. I had to go. But with all this uh, uh, hatred that was building up in Slovakia, eventually, again, it didn't take long when uh, the Germans were looking for uh, volunteers. They wanted more volunteers to work in, in Germany. And uh, not many come forward because uh, Joseph Tiso, he was a dictator and uh, the Slovak people suffered under his regime. Anybody that belonged to different political outlook was being arrested. Anybody that spread any rumor against the government was being arrested. So they become this uh, hatred against the regime and when he called uh, for more volunteers to come forward, not many come forward. And that was very embarrassing for Tiso that he couldn't serve his master in Berlin. And therefore, some of his extremists suddenly saw a solution, how to get rid of some of the Jews. And they suggested to the German, it was the uh, representative, his name was Dieter Wislitzeni, he was advisor to the uh, Slovak uh, government, he was a high-ranking German officer. They suggested to him, what about if we give you young Jewish men and women that can work as uh, slave labor in Germany, Poland, wherever you will need them. Uh, Dieter went uh, back to Berlin. He consulted with his uh, superior, and he came back that the German government will agree to this arrangement. And so the first uh, young Jewish men and women began to be arrested. It wasn't even an arrest. They, they called uh, young Jewish men and women uh, to come forward. They got uh, letters to report at a cert certain place. And at the time, it was actually quite a, a celebratory atmosphere when these young Jewish men and women were reporting to these places because uh, Jewish people were not allowed to work and it, it felt very uh, embarrassing that young men and women didn't work, so they thought, well, we at least will be working and earning our living, not realizing at the time that they might be taken away. I remember we accompanied uh, some of my cousins, and we were all joking and laughing and um, said goodbye to them. We didn't even cry for them, not realizing that after a uh, while they were taken away, they were transported to Auschwitz and uh, Treblinka and all these uh, extermination camps and within a very uh, short period they probably uh, perished. So they also took our uh, teachers away. And so it was about uh, February 1942 that we were told that the school, school is uh, closing because the teachers were being uh, taken away. And so my education ended in February 1942. Next time I went to school was uh, 1946 after the war. So I completely lost my basic education. And I will never forget the day when I started to go to school. I had to sit with children six, seven years old. I was at the time already 10 years old because I couldn't read, I couldn't write, I couldn't do any mathematics, and I had to work very, very hard. Also my brother, we had to work very hard, so we caught up with our own age as soon as we could. I have to say that uh, we didn't do badly. My brother became a big industrialist uh, still today, and I was uh, also, I qualified as a diploma engineer eventually, and had my own business. So with all the setback, we didn't do badly. We had a nice family built a home. But uh, at the time, uh, we were, of course, uh, uh, for 
for all this time, uh, we didn't go to school. At the time, they started to take the young men and women and the uh, Slovak government uh, very quickly realized that if the German will take all the young men and Jewish men and women, uh, they will be left with the mother, children and the old people and eventually they will have to look after them because the breadwinners were being taken away. So again, a delegation went to uh, Dieter Wislicenius said, look, you're taking all the young men and women. You might as well take all the Jewish people because otherwise uh, it will be a burden on the government. And so uh, the big deportation of uh, Slovak Jewry began. First, uh, they took the young men and women there, anybody that was not useful to the Slovak economy. Because my father was a farmer, he was useful to the Slovak economy. And at the time, in 1942, we got a document that for the time being, they shouldn't take us. So in this first phase of deportation from Slovakia, which went uh, unabated from March till October, we were safe. In March 1942, in Slovakia, there were about 90,000 Jews, 85, 90,000 Jews, about 3% of the population. The, as I mentioned, the deportation went unabated from March uh, till October. In this six, seven months period, 52 transport left Slovakia, each transport between 1,000 and 1,500 Jews. Altogether, 58,000 Jews were deported at the time. According to the statistic, uh, after the war, out of the 58,000 Jews, only between 280 and 500 survived. The rest of them all perished in the Holocaust. Among them, about 30 members of my family, my uncles, aunts, uh, my grandparents from my father's side, uh, a cousin that I knew very well, they used to come on the annual holiday to our village. We always used to play together. I knew them all. We said goodbye to them. We didn't even cry to them for them. We said, when all this is over, we will be reunited. Everything will be okay. I remember it was July when they came from my grandfather, grandparents from my father's house. We cried a little bit. We said goodbye when this is over. Uh, we will be reunited. Nobody imagined what was happening, but unfortunately, when these people were taken away, within a couple of days, uh, maybe a week, they were deported to, uh, to this extermination camp and Birkenau, Auschwitz. In fact, the first people gassed in Birkenau were, were the Slovak Jewry. They were the first people at the time when uh, Slovakia demanded that they should take all the Jews. Eichmann actually said, uh, we can't take them for the moment because the gas chamber were not ready. And once they were ready, uh, it was in March, April, uh, they were taken there. And as I said, probably within a couple of uh, days or week, uh, these people perished. And uh, when we said goodbye to them, this was for the last time and we saw them. But in October, the deportation suddenly stopped. There was political reason for it, and um, the deportation stopped. Uh, but uh, Jews were still being uh, uh, arrested. They were uh, being uh, put in detention camps in Slovakia, but slowly the news were filtering from Auschwitz and this extermination camp, what was happening to the Jews. So we were very frightened. We, we did everything possible. Many Jews converted to uh, different religions and they hid, they built bunkers under houses and they uh, lived there for months and uh, years because uh, they just hid so that they don't need to go out and save their life. And uh, so we in the village uh, we used to, my father had of course the farm, 
And any time the police was on the way in the neighboring village, we would be informed that they are on the way to the village. The population did not cooperate with the fascist regime of Joseph Tiso because I said uh, the Slovak people themselves uh, suffered. So we got quite a bit of uh, help. They would notify us. We would lock the house and run to the cornfield and we would stay there for the whole day. And in the evening they would tell, that, uh, tell us the uh, people that the police was there, the house was locked, they probably went and told the superior that we were not in the houses. And this used to happen all the time. Sometimes we didn't have much time, we just ran into the barn and we climb on a ladder in, onto the uh, attic and pull the ladder up and we stay there. And even our employees didn't know that we were hiding there. We had the place there with, with water and things. So we had all prepared in case uh, we are surprised and we run. Other time we used to sleep in the houses of our employees when there was rumor that the police will be doing raids during the night. And that was very heroic of the people that took us in because if they were found out that they were hiding Jewish people, uh, they would have been arrested and very severely punished. This went like this for about two years. We sort of play hide and seek with the police. Uh, we were surprised once or, once or twice in the house by the police. It was the local people that were uh, surprised us. And I remember my father one time bribed one of the policemen. He said, look, here you have, go out for, for, for half an hour and then come back. And he would do that for money. And while he did this, we locked the house and we hid. And uh, so we saved ourselves. We were not uh, uh, taken away. But on the 29th of August, 1944, the Slovak nation rebelled against the regime of Joseph Tiso. Because as I said, it was a dictatorial regime and people hated it. There was an uprising and um, many uh, soldiers from the Slovak army defected, joined the rebellion. Many police defected and joined the rebellion. So Tiso didn't have the uh, power to suppress this uprising and therefore for the first time Germany occupied Slovakia. They didn't occupy Slovakia because they wanted to occupy Slovakia, but because they wanted to save their uh, friendly regime of Joseph Tiso, of course, which they succeeded within three weeks. They uh, suppressed this uprising. Many Slovaks died in this uprising. They estimated about 17,000 men and women that began to fight. Uh, were killed in this, this battle and it was suppressed, but the resistance continued. There were the resistant people, they did all kinds of sabotage work after the, uh, uh, the, the uprising was suppressed. Unfortunately, with the German army, also a unit of Adolf Eichmann came to Slovakia. And we knew once uh, these uh, uh, police come, it was the Gestapo, the German secret police. They will join the Helinka Guard, which was the Slovak police responsible for arresting Jews. They join uh, together, they will become very efficient. They will put spies in the villages and town to spy on the remainder of the 25, 30,000 Jews that were still left in Slovakia. We knew the document that we had will not uh, be uh, valid anymore. So the remainder of the Jews in Slovakia was doomed. And we knew uh, that if we stay in the village, sooner or later somebody will betray us because we didn't know who was our friend and who was our enemy. Uh, we decided to leave, but of course with a name like Reichenthal, we wouldn't have got very far because uh, uh, Reichenthal is sort of uh, German, uh, uh, German name, and if we were not German, uh, we were Jewish. 
So we needed really false paper. My parents were very friendly with the local priest. His name was Ladislav Harangozov. He was a good priest. He did not preach hatred against the Jews in the church. He preached Christianity. My parents uh, and my grandparents, they, they socialized with uh, uh, Father Harangozo. And um, he suggested in the past, he said to my mother, you know, it's very difficult to be Jewish. Why don't you convert? I will do the conversion. But my mother never took up the suggestion because the law in Slovakia was that only Jews that were converted before 1922, their conversion would be recognized. Anybody afterwards, they didn't recognize it for the obvious reason because they knew it wasn't genuine. They just did it to save their life. So it wouldn't have helped us anyway. But this time, my mother said to Father Haran Gozom, we have to leave the village but we need false paper because with uh, our name, we wouldn't get uh, very far everywhere in the train station, any crossing. There was police, you had to identify yourself. So we would have been caught very quickly. And uh, my mother asked, could you get us false paper? And he said, he will. And within a couple of days, he got us a false paper with the name Vida. Vida was a typical Slovak name, just like here you would have Murphy or Connor. It's a typical Irish name, and I can assure you there is no Jewish family in Ireland that is called Murphy or Connor. So Vida was a typical uh, Slovak name, and you know, we could freely move with, uh, with uh, these documents. Nobody would suspect that we were Jewish. And it was the uh, middle of September, uh, that we were going to move out of the village. Uh, but the priest said, you know, when you move to a new place, your children will have to go to national school. Slovakia is a very Roman Catholic uh, country. It was then and it's still today. And if your children go into this national school uh, and they don't know anything about uh, Roma, uh, Catholic religion, the children will very quickly realize that they are not Roman Catholic. So before you leave, they should come to me to church and I will uh, give them lesson to teach them about uh, religion, a little bit the basic uh, uh, thing. So uh, for about two or three weeks, uh, two and a half weeks, we went to Father Harangozo every day for four hours and he taught us the prayer that the children uh, pray before the uh, day, school day. He, he taught us about the various holiday in the Roman Catholic calendar. He taught us about the station of the cross, how to cross ourselves, how to make a grace. All these little things uh, that we were not totally ignorant. Uh, uh, and if a conversation is uh, about the religion, that we can get involved. And so it was after about um, the middle of September that we left the uh, village. It was my mother, my brother, and myself. My father had to stay behind because he had to look after the livestock and, uh, and the farm. He said, look, I have friends in the village. Uh, they will help me and everything will be all right. We went to Bratislava where we were going to pick up my grandmother, my mother's mother, and she was coming with us to this uh, new place. But we were only a couple of days in Bratislava when we were notified that my father was arrested and taken away. At the time already, uh, the adult among us knew what that meant, and therefore my mother thought she will never uh, see her husband again. We thought we will never see our father again. But after several days, we received a postcard from my father, and there were four words. I'm alive. Don't worry. We didn't know where it came from and what happened to him. But thankfully, after the war, we were reunited, and it's, it's really a miracle because in these cases, mostly uh, when people were split like this, they never were reunited. But uh, 
My father uh, told us what happened. He, he, one day he was walking out, uh, which he used to do. I used to go with him, and we would go to see the field, to see that everything is growing uh, nice. There was one nice weather. We would take the dog with us. And my father went like this, and this lorry was coming opposite him. He didn't suspect anything, but uh, unfortunately it was a lorry of the Rinka Guard. And one of the men in the lorry was a local man. So my father didn't jump into the ditch to hide or anything, he just continued to walk. And when the lorry came near to him, this man suddenly said, that's a Jew. He knew my father very well. And he was betrayed and they picked up my father. He didn't allow him even to go. Uh, to the house to take anything because he was embarrassed. He didn't want to show the population that he betrayed my father. He was taken to detention camp Seret from where again the deportation uh, started. He was put on an, uh, into a cattle cart and uh, was taken most probably uh, to Auschwitz. But uh, in this cattle cart there was a Hungarian man he suddenly stood up, and it was in the night, because this train always used to go in night, so that the population didn't see what they were doing to the Jewish people. He stood up and he said, um, I'm going to open this cattle cart, and anybody wants to save himself uh, should jump after me. This man already escaped before twice. He was a, a crook. He was a safe cracker, he was specialized in that, and he put a saw blade in the handle of the suitcase and he proceeded to take this uh, uh, saw blade out and he managed to cut a hole in the door. I don't know if you saw a cattle cart, it has a sliding door and from outside it is uh, sort of closed with a hook, so you can't open it from inside, but he obviously managed to put hand through opened it, opened the cattle cart, jumped out, and after him, my father was standing beside, he jumped out, and after my father, another man. In actual fact, only three men jumped out of this uh, cattle cart, because not everybody has the courage to jump from a fast-moving train into the darkness. So these three men uh, proceeded to go to the forest, uh, because that was still sort of safe. The Germans were afraid to go to forest. They couldn't take the uh, tanks and heavy equipment. And if they come on foot, there was the uh, partisan, the resistance army that could be uh, ambushed. So they went to the forest and eventually they met a group of partisans. They joined them and they fought till end of the war and thankfully uh, su survived. We were in Bratislava, my mother was going to collect and her mother. She put myself and my brother and myself in a, a photographic shop. It was about 200 yards from the shop where she was picking up her mother. She said, you stay here and on the way back, I pick you up and we go to the train station. But my mother never came back because when she came into the shop, suddenly she saw her mother she was beaten up, her face was all swollen, uh, black, and she knew that something terrible happened. Unfortunately, my grandmother was betrayed, and she was beaten up. She was an old lady, 76 year, six year old. At the time, 76 was very old age. Today, we still think it's quite young age. And the police come in, the Gestapo, and they beat her up because they knew that she couldn't look after herself, and they beat her up to tell them uh, who is looking after her. And she gave the name of her, bra uh, her son and daughter, and they were arrested as well. So when my mother saw it all, she pretended that she came to come collect laundry. She had to identify herself immediately, and they picked up the, the document, and there it was, um, Judith. Veda that was all right, but unfortunately the priest did not change her maiden name. Her maiden name was Shaimovic. Shaimovic was sort of a Hungarian Slovak name. He thought he doesn't need to change it. But of course, uh, the old lady 
her name was Rosalia Scheimov, so they knew right away it was, uh, uh, my mother was the daughter, she was arrested. Uh, when they opened the cases, they found children clothes and they said to my mother, where are your children? And my mother knew if she tried to spin some story or uh, denied that uh, anything, they would beat up and uh, in the end she will have to tell them because uh, the Gestapo, they were law to themselves. It's not like today if a policeman harms somebody, you have to fill up forms and things. The Gestapo, they could kill somebody, they didn't need to report to anybody. So if they wanted to find any information, one way or another, they got it. So my mother just told them where we were, and the next thing, these two tall men entered the shop. We knew right away it was the Gestapo because they had uniform. The uniform was a long leather coat, a, a swastika on the left arm, hat, and Polish boots, and they come straight to my brother and said, you're Jewish? And my brother said, no, I'm not Jewish. My name is Miklos Vida. We, we thought with a name like Vida, he will not suspect we are Jewish. Of course, he knew. And he asked him a couple of times. My brother was still denying at the time. My brother was nearly 13 years old. He was quite tall for his age. And uh, after a couple of times denying it, they started to beat him up. But he still wouldn't tell them. So they turned around to me and they said, but you're Jewish. And I said, no, I'm not Jewish. My name is Thomas Vida. I'm not Jewish. Again, he asked me two or three times, and the next thing, I was being slapped and beaten as well. My brother, I was at the time nine year old. My brother was always very protective of me. When he saw that they're beating me up, he jumped out. He said, please, please, don't beat my brother. We are Jewish. And we were taken to the shop, and there we saw 13 of us from the family were arrested on that day. We were taken to the Gestapo headquarters in Bratislava, where we stay overnight in the cellar there, and next morning we were taken to detention camp Seret. In Seret, they did the selection. I don't know if you heard the word selection, but in the Jewish vocabulary, it is a very frightening word, because in this selection, family will split. The young men and women went to the right, and uh, mother, children, and all people to the left. And that uh, meant that this group is going to live, and this group is going to die. And it was uh, done by a high-ranking officer. His name was Alios Brunner. Alios Brunner was a, a high-ranking German officer. He, he escaped, he escaped actually to Syria, and only recently in the news they said that uh, he is not being sought anymore after because uh, they had the proof that uh, he actually died four years ago in 2010. So I, I always used to say, I don't know, he might be still alive. He would have been today about 102. Uh, but he never stood the trial. There was a time about 15, 20 years ago that uh, the German and the Israelis were calling for his extradition, that he can stand a crime for crime against humanity. But of course, because of the situation in the Middle East, the, uh, Syria never gave him up. So he never stood the trial. He died four years ago. So it was on the 2nd of November, 19. 44, that we were called onto the roll call. Our group of 13, we were coming front of Alias Brunner, and he would say, you go to the right, and you go on to the left. And our group of 13 was split. Seven went to the right, and six of us, uh, which was my grandmother, my aunt, one of my cousins, my mother, and my brother, and myself, to the left. I remember at the time, when my aunt said goodbye to her husband, she didn't even have time to uh, kiss him or anything, just waved her hand and said goodbye. Unfortunately, the group on the right side went to Sachsenhausen and Buchenwald. Buchenwald was a slave labor camp. The inmate worked in stone quarry. 
They walk 12 hours a day with very little food, in freezing cold, in disease. The life expectancy in Buchenwald was between two and three months. So out of the group of seven, only one person uh, survived, which was my cousin. He was 15 years old. The rest of them uh, perished. So when we waved our hand and said goodbye to them, we did not realize that it was the last time uh, we saw them. We were put into cattle car. Now, the, the moment that we were put into the cattle cart, it's a moment that I will never forget. There was straw on the floor in the middle of the cart. There was an open, large open bowl with a couple of buckets that served as toilet. The moment the door closed behind us, uh, we were cut from the civilized life. I mean, I can't describe the moment because you're living, we can say, a comfortable life, civilized life, and suddenly, from one minute to the next, you find yourself in a situation worse than the animals that were uh, traveling in these uh, carriages. Still, the stench was there. And we were traveling like this for seven days. There was no privacy. The stench became unbearable. There was no hygiene. We didn't have any water to wash ourselves. Very little food occasionally. The train stopped on a sideline and the bowl would be emptied and uh, then it closed. There was no windows, only four little vents. So there was very little uh, air in there. We didn't know where we were going, what is happening. We were traveling like this seven days. One woman actually died on the way. She got very, very sick and she, she passed away. And I remember the corpse lying on the, in the ground in uh, front of us. So you can imagine as a nine-year-old boy, I, for the first time, I saw a dead person lying there and it, it, it was horrific, the whole uh, the way going uh, seven days, traveling like this, uh, with uh, no air and the situation only came worse from day to day. But it was on the 9th of November, middle of the night, that suddenly the door was flung open and we were greeted, we shout, rouse, rouse, schnell, schnell, out, out, quickly, quickly, they were SS guard on the platform with Alsatian dog barking with weapon, uh, the shouting and pushing, the whole system was designed to totally demoralize us. This was a process that happened all over where these concentration camps were to totally demoralize us. And people after talked, how could you just follow the orders you should have uh, resisted and you couldn't. You were, there was a system to put such fears into you that you just follow the order and you did whatever they told you. And I remember we were coming from the carriage. As I said, my brother was quite tall uh, for his age and suddenly the, the SS man grabbed my brother by the shoulder and said, you son of a bitch, go there, help this woman with the corpse. And, we got terrible fright that we were uh, separated and we, we couldn't see anything. The searchlight was lighting into our eyes. It was raining. Uh, so we started to shout, Miklos, Miklos, so that he can join us, uh, uh, so that we are not uh, separated. And after a couple of minutes, after they took the corpse and they threw it onto a lorry, he joined us. We were put into row and taken onto a march which lasted about two and a half hours. We didn't march on the road for the obvious reason. They didn't want it to show the population what they were doing to the Jews. We were marching through a forest and it was raining. The, the ground was very soggy, so it was very difficult to walk and they were pushing us with the weapon all the time. Schnell, schnell, quickly, quickly, everything was done to all the time put us under pressure. We were very worried about my grandmother because she was an old lady that she will not survive this ordeal. But after two and a half hours, 
we suddenly on the horizon saw this tall chimney glow coming out. So you can imagine the people, the adults basically among us, they already knew at the time in 1944 about the gas chamber, about the crematoria. When they saw this chimney, they thought we are going there, that this is perhaps the last minute, last hour that we are walking on this earth. So it was very depressing situation, very worrying. Everybody was in a terrible state that perhaps uh, we are being taken uh, to gas chamber. But we were taken through a large uh, barbed wire gate, brought to a big hut and told to go to sleep. There were bunk bed, three bed, one over another. So we took two of these beds and six of us just fell into the bed because after seven days being crunched in the same place, whether you sat or you stood, you had to be there all the time. A cattle cart is not very big and there was about 50 of us and there was the barrel in the middle. So there was not much room to move. So you were seven days in the same position like this. So when we come there and told to go to sleep, we just fell on the bed. We didn't even take the clothes off or anything. We were absolutely soaked through. And it felt like a couple of minutes, the next thing we hear, Aufstehen, schnell, schnell, auf Zellapil, get up to a roll call. And we were pushed to, to the roll call and uh, for the first time, we were told that we are in Bergen Belsen concentration camp, Germany. We didn't know what Bergen Belsen was, where Bergen Belsen was. So it took uh, quite a while uh, till we discovered, uh, uh, went uh, some history about uh, Bergen Belsen. But what we found when we arrived there, it was hell on earth. What we saw was the skeleton walking around, shaved head, striped pyjama, they walked very slowly. We didn't know even if they were women or men because they were only skeleton. You couldn't see any attribute. It took days before we discovered that we were in fact in a woman camp where the hospital was. Belgian Belgium was built in 1939 uh, northern, Germ Northern Germany, about 80 kilometers north of Hanover. First, uh, uh, for Belgian and French prisoners of war, and later for Polish and Russian prisoners of war. These soldiers built the camp from scratch. In Northern Germany, the temperature would drop to minus 10, 15, 20, sometime even to minus 25. Now, I, can I can't describe the cold in that situation because it, I remember here several years ago, we had minus 10 degrees, and I remember with our double glazing and uh, central heating, uh, we were freezing. There we had just wooden block, no heating or anything. So we couldn't even go out. It was so cold, and we would sit, five of us on a bed, and collect the blanket, each person had two blankets put over us and we would be huddled like this for hours just to keep ourselves uh, warm. But at the time when these soldiers were building the camp, of course, they didn't have roof over their head. They used to sleep out in the open in this uh, uh, severe cold. So many of them uh, froze to death, many of them uh, starved to death and of course, there was disease as well. So it is estimated that within one year, 20,000 of these soldiers, uh, Russian and Polish soldiers, perished in Belgian Belsen. As, uh, uh, the, the first, as I said, it was a, a, a prisoners of war camp, but in 1943, the German authority decided to convert the camp to be a detention camp mainly for Jewish people, but they were also gypsies, uh, Jehovah Witnesses, uh, gay and lesbian. Uh, they were also um, uh, political prisoners, German political prisoners. So the camp was divided in about seven parts. There was the men camp, and then was also the women camp. 
So when we come there and saw this scene around, we seeing this uh, skeleton walking very slowly around. Eventually we found out that uh, we were in fact in woman camp where the camp hospital was. Now when I say hospital, you think the hospital was there to cure the people, but the hospital in Belgium, Belgium, there's no medication. The women that were brought there were really women, very, very sick, they're typhoid or any other disease, and they come basically to die there. So we saw these women walking around, and they used to walk very, very slowly. Eventually, they would fall down as children. We used to play outside, and when we saw that she fell down, we would sort of stop and watch if she will get up or not. Because we knew if she didn't get up, she died. If she got up, we sort of were relieved, perhaps she will live another day or two. And this used to happen every day, not by once, not twice, several times. So we actually saw people dying in front of our eyes. They would fall down, they would stand there. In most cases, she never got up. She died when she fell. Our day started with a roll call. Now, it's not roll call that uh, we are used to in school here. The roll call started about 7 o'clock in the morning in freezing cold. We had to stand there for about an hour till our supervisor came. The supervisors were young women. They were 23, 24 year old women. They come like models. They had a tailored uniform, lacquer on the nail, lipstick. They would come and they would try to count us. It was all designed very cleverly. Uh, they were smart and they were the master. You looked up to them. And we were only dirt. And when I say dirt, we were dirty because we lived in our clothes, what we brought with us. We didn't have the striped pajama. And we lived during the day in the clothes and we slept in the clothes because we only had two blankets. It was freezing there. And we didn't wear our clothes for a week or two. We wore it for months, never having a, a shower or anything. So you can imagine the state we were must have stunk like uh, terrible. And these women, they were very, very smart. So it was a deliberate uh, to put us in this uh, situation to look up to them. After the roll call, uh, we would get breakfast, which consisted of two slices of bread and black coffee, basically black water. And then uh, we got lunch, which was uh, turnips cut into sort of square, about uh, inch square, boiled in water. And that was our lunch, and occasionally we saw even potato, which was uh, uh, delicious. And in the evening, we had, um, uh, again, two slices of bread and coffee. Occasionally, we got a little square of margarine or jam. And that was the food that we ate every day, the same food every day. And if we compare it uh, to today, I mean, we eat around 2,300, 2,500 calories a day. But we ate, uh, making a calculation for it, was uh, equivalent to six crackers. Six crackers is about 600 calories, maybe a little bit more. That's what we ate every day. So you can live on six crackers for a day or two, but when you do eat like this for weeks and months, you starve and you're starving all the time. Not for a day, not for a day, week. You starve for months. And if you starve such a long period, the body eats itself from, in, from inside. You're getting weaker and weaker, skinnier and skinnier, till you become like a skeleton and finally you die. When we were liberated, I was a skeleton. I had to be put in hospital right away. And then when I returned to Slovakia, I was uh, sent to recuperate for six, six weeks. Uh, because if I wasn't uh, liberated at the time, it was only a matter of time, perhaps a couple of weeks, maybe months, I would have perished as well. 
So that the condition in Belgium, Belgium were uh, horrendous. Uh, people were dying every day, mainly because of typhoids. Belgium, Belgium was not extermination camp in the sense that we had gas chamber. In Belgium, Belgium, we had a crematoria. The crematoria was there to burn the corpses. For the obvious reason, again, the German didn't want to leave any dead around or graves or graveyard, because if later somebody come, they can say that nobody died in Belgium, Belgium, because the corpses were uh, burned there and the ashes were thrown all around. This uh, crematoria went 24 hours a day, from the day we arrived till the day we were liberated. Every morning, the Sonderkommando, the special commando, come from the main camp. They had this cart with two wheels, and they would go from hut to hut to check if anybody died. There were about 80 huts in Belgium, Belgium. If anybody died, they would go in, pick up the corpse, throw it onto the cart. Once the cart was full, it would be brought to the mortuary, and in the evening, a cart with horse or a lorry would come, pick up these corpses, it would be brought to the crematoria, and uh, it would be born. So the, during the day, the, uh, the smoke came from the chimney, spreading over the camp, so there was a constant uh, stench of uh, burning flesh. But after a couple of days, weeks, we got used to it, we didn't even smell it anymore. That it was a routine life in Belgium, Belgium, and we liked it that way. Because if it was routine, we knew from day to day, as long as it's the same, nothing changes, we are all right. I remember one time on a roll call, four officers came with our supervisors, and they stood sort of in a corner. And they were joking, laughing, and they, they, our mothers and uh, everybody was in a panic. Why these officers were there? What, what are they talking about? Is it they were going to take us away? What is going to happen to us? So routine was very important because we knew that as long as we don't see anybody and things go according to the plan, everything will be all right. We lived really from day to day because we never knew what will happen next day. But already in January 1945, uh, the Germans were uh, losing the war, and they were retreating from the west to the east, in other words, from Poland to, to Germany and uh, to, Slovak, to Czechoslovakia. And they were taking the prisoners with them. So Auschwitz also had to be evacuated in January, and the, because the road and the railway line were bombed, they took them and they had to march from the west to the east. And these marches were huge, thousands and thousands, because in, uh, in uh, Auschwitz at any time, there were about 150,000 inmates. It was a slave labor camp. You know, there was a lot of industry around Auschwitz, but it was, of course, also an extermination camp in Auschwitz. Uh, uh, millions perished, but if these people were being taken with the retreating army. I was uh, reading about one of these marches, there were 16,000 left uh, Auschwitz, by the time they reached the destination, only 10,000 were left. 6,000 died on the way, and it, they used to sleep out in the open, many of them froze to death. Anybody that couldn't keep pace was shot and left on the side of the road. So these uh, marches and the name, the death marches of Auschwitz, because thousands died. And many of these inmates from Auschwitz arrived to Belgian Belsen. So the population of Belgian Belsen within a very short period of a couple of weeks grew from 25,000 to over 60,000. There was no room for these inmates, there was no food, our portions were reduced to two meals a day. Uh, huts that uh, contain about 150 to 180 people suddenly con 
contain 700, 800 people. So you can imagine the congestion, just to imagine here, if suddenly we put double as many people here, how congestion it would have been. And the epidemic of typhoid broke out in Belgium, Belgium, and people began to die in vast number. It is estimated that in February and in March, per day, 500 people were dying, 15,000 per month. So the crematoria no longer could cope with that amount of corpses, so the corpses were being just thrown outside of the huts. The crematoria couldn't cope with it. And these piles of corpses were growing from day to day. Our area, as children, where we used to play, it was a nice green area because Belgian Belsen was built in the middle of a forest. And we used to play this open space. Suddenly, this open space was being filled up with corpses. <coughs> as children, we continued to play. Where did we play? We played among these corpses. We played hide and seek, hiding behind decomposing and rotting corpses. I mean, I can't describe the scene. The stench was unbearable, but again, we got used to it. And these piles were growing up to four feet high, as far as the eye could see. It is estimated when Belgian Belsen was liberated that they were uh, lying about between 17 to 30,000 corpses all around us. And these corpses were decomposing. The British Army, uh, before they entered the camp, they were about two miles outside of the camp. They said the stench was unbearable. And we lived there, we didn't even notice it. But we knew at the time already that the liberation is near. We didn't know when, but it still took four months. As you know, uh, Auschwitz was liberated in uh, 27th of January. So when the inmates from Auschwitz came, they said that the German army was uh, retreating and it's only a matter of time, but unfortunately it took still uh, four months. But we uh, suffered the tragedy as well. It was on the 7th of March, <coughs> 1945. I never forget that day, and it's uh, a memory that I will carry with me for the rest of my life. Also my brother, who is still alive, and my, my cousin, that we were together. This, uh, what happened, we will never forget it. I remember that morning, uh, I saw my mother, and my aunt crying and I said, uh, why are you crying? What happened? And they said to me, my grandmother passed away. And that morning, these two men entered uh, the room. We had to strip her and I remember the skin was just hanging. It was like, she was like a little baby, just a little skeleton. They picked her up by her leg and feet, uh, her hand and threw her on the cart and then uh, they were le uh, wheeled outside and thrown on the piles of corpses. That was her funeral, so uh, we will never forget uh, that morning. But as I say, we were waiting to be liberated. It was on the 11th of April, 1945, that suddenly we didn't see any guards in the watchtower. We knew that something was happening, but nobody dared to leave the camp because the inmates thought that perhaps uh, uh, the German put an ambush outside and the gate was open and they would start to shoot us. So nobody left, but any food that was still in the camp was ransacked by the inmates. Uh, the German, they sabotaged the pump that brought the water, so there was no water. Some of them were drinking the rainwater, which was very dangerous. It was dirty, you got diarrhea. If you got diarrhea, you got dehydrated and you died. It was like sentenced to death. And in fact, after the liberation, still thousands of inmates of Belgian Belsen died because they just uh, were too, too far gone. For four days, we didn't have any water or food. It was on the 15th of April, 1945, afternoon that we heard this rumble going through the camp 
and we all ran towards the barbed wires to see what was happening. And there we saw jeeps, lorries, armored vehicles, tanks were coming through the center of the camp. There was a white road, and uh, soldiers with loud hailers were shouting, this is the British army. You are being liberated. We didn't even know what liberated mean, but we knew that we were free. In one of the first jeep, there was a, a film crew that filmed the entry into the camp. And this film was the first film that the Western world saw what was happening in this concentration camp. And it was so horrific that even though people realized that, that there was atrocity committed and uh, people were being massacred, nobody could imagine the picture that we were in, the, were in these films. And I'm sure if you saw uh, documentaries, archives, films, and you see these bulldozers pushing these corpses into uh, large pits, that, that happened in Belgium, Belgium. As I said, there were between 20 to 30,000 corpses lying around. They had to use the bulldozer to uh, push these corpses in. And therefore, after the war, Belgium and Belgium became the most notorious uh, camp. We saw this film many, many years later, and of course we recorded it, uh, and uh, then we looked at the film, and when we saw children at the barbed wire, we took picture by picture to see if we can see ourselves, because we remember that we were at that barbed wire. And this is one of these pictures, and uh, I don't show uh, the horrific picture of Belgian and Belsen because uh, they are very distressing. But this is the picture that uh, when we took frame by frame, and you can see the barbed wire, and obviously we were filmed. And this boy on the top here, as I said, it's my brother. He, he was quite tall. I am somewhere there as well, but um, I, can't see, I, my, I can't see myself. Uh, but I always went with my brother, so I might have just uh, hit by somebody there. But uh, this is really the moment that we were liberated. So that's the momentum of the liberation. I remember at the time, uh, some of the women, they went and they broke branches from the trees and they threw them at the um, soldiers as a welcoming sign. Now, there was no celebration. We didn't dance around because 90% of the inmates of Belgium Belgium were sick. I just want to show you another picture <coughs> just to show you how dehumanized we were at the time. And this is a group of women. This is also after the liberation. <coughs> they are sitting here. They are cooking and they're going to eat. And what you see here behind them, and it's all around, these are corpses lying around. And these corpses are dead, not there from yesterday. They're from, there from weeks and months. And this is already April. April is already beginning to be warm. And these women are going to eat. You can imagine the stench around them. And that's how the human eyes we, we It's just indescribable. I just want to also read you some witness description. This was a medical team that was being prepared to enter the camp and the commanding officer was preparing them what to expect. At the time, Bergen Belsen was called the horror camp because it was so horrific. The next morning, 17th of April, on a parade, in, uh, April 1945, on a parade, our commanding officer addressed us. He had visited the horror camp and corroborated the rumor. It is unbelievable, he said. There is no organization, no food, nothing. Half starved, emaciated, spiritless, demented. These people are roaming the camp, have been reduced to animal level. I went through the women's quarter of the camp hospital. It was only about 100 yards from where we lived. Many of them are stark naked and are literally crawling about on their hands and knees. Too weak to walk. They bedded, just skin and bone, lying their own down. In one small room were 40 women, few with any clothes, huddled together to keep warm. 
Some of these women have been dead for days. Nobody had come to dispose of their bodies. I have seen some sad. I thought I could take anything, but this shook me, made me vomit. Outside the dead are piled four feet high over a large area and bulldozers are having to be employed to shovel these bodies into large pits. I could tell you more, even worse, but it is too sickening to talk about. That was Bergen Belsen. I want to read you also three lines from another letter that was written by Reverend Morrison. He was a chaplain in the British Army that liberated uh, camp. He was Irish. And he wrote this letter to his sister, Nora Birmingham, in Ballysimon County, Limerick. I just read you three lines. So far, I have buried over 15,000, and I have not been able to attend a funeral, as I consider the dying more important than the dead. Those 15,000 did not take up much of my time, as 10 grave help up to 5,000 bodies each. As I said, Belgian Belsen was not extermination camp, but in Belgian Belsen over 70,000 people died. And they died a horrific death. Some of the people, uh, they in the pain of dying because the death in Belgian Belsen didn't happen over a day or week. Sometimes it took months. It was so painful that some of the inmates couldn't bear the pain. They, during the night, they used to run towards the barbed wire to the perimeter. And uh, once they started to climb, the uh, soldier would see them, they would shoot them. They didn't want to escape, but they wanted to escape the, uh, the pain that they were suffering. We used to hear the shots being fired. And in the morning, we used to see two or three the corpse is lying over the barbed wire, only in our section, but it used to happen all over the camp because uh, the people were just couldn't bear uh, the suffering they were going through. I just want to mention a couple of things. Joseph Tiso was put on trial in 1947 by the Czechoslovak government. He was sentenced to death by hanging for crime against the humanity, not necessarily what he did to the Jews but what he did uh, to his own people. Uh, out of the population of uh, Jews of Slovakia, which numbered around 85 to 90,000, only 17,000 uh, survived. The rest of them all perished in the Holocaust, among them 35 members of my family. 45 uh, guards were put on trial. It uh, happened in Lunenburg. Uh, there were 11 sentenced to death uh, for crime against humanity among them. And the commander of Belgian Belsen, Joseph Kramer, he was a sadist, he was a, a murderer. He used to stand on a balcony beside the kitchen, and when some of the inmates came towards the kitchen to steal some food because they were starving, he just shot them. And he used to leave the corpses around, and when we went to our roll call, these corpses were lying there as a warning, if you do something out of the line, this what will happen to you. Uh, there were several of them uh, acquitted, and about 19 got a different length of uh, uh, prison, but over 200 guards they never stood a trial. Uh, many of them had blood on their hand. They pleaded that they carried out order and got, got away with it. We must remember that the uh, uh, Holocaust did not start with gas chamber. Holocaust started with uh, uh, whisper, with taunt, with dubbing, with abuse, and finally murder. So we have to be very careful if we see, especially I tell the uh, student, when they see somebody's bullet in their classes, especially that we had such a severe recession, people tend to blame other people for the problem. 
So if they see somebody's uh, bullet in the class because they're different religion or uh, because they're foreign or because they're different color skin, they shouldn't become bystander. They should stand up to these bullies because nobody stood up to them when it was happening to us and look uh, where it led to. I'm not suggesting that such a thing can happen here. But we have to stop it before it goes too far. We have uh, uh, racism in uh, Ireland. It's not reported so much. I remember several years when it all started here, there was a lot of reporting about it. But uh, it's happened in school and we have to be very careful. And I always, always stress, don't become a bystander. Get involved. Stop it. Holocaust was a unique event. It shouldn't be compared to anything that happened since. And let's hope never happen again. Holocaust was premeditated. Factories were built to exterminate the entire Jewish population of Europe that numbered 11 million. They succeeded to kill 6 million, as I mentioned before. 35 among those were uh, from my family. I want to finish with a poem which is very appropriate to this uh, lecture. It was written by Yehuda Bauer in 2001. The horror of Holocaust is not that it deviated from the human norms. The horror is that it didn't. What happened might happen again to others, not necessary Jews, perpetrated by other not necessary German. We are all possible victims, possible perpetrators, possible bystanders. Thank you for your patience. Thank you. <laughs> okay, um, now we're going to have a short question and answer session, and after that, for the people who are in the two classrooms watching it being streamed, they're welcome to come here if they would like to buy books. Um, we have a number of books on sale. Wendy will have them at the back. They're for 15 euro. And Tommy will sign any books if you've brought books. So we'll start off with um, questions. And can I please ask that people, before you start to speak, make sure it's a question rather than a statement and keep the questions as short as you can so that we can fit in and, and let Tommy answer them. So, um, does anybody have any questions? Yeah. So there's two here in the center. And um, Paul is just going to go with the microphone. Hello. Uh, I'm just wondering, how did you choose Ireland to come to afterwards? Well, Ireland, uh, how I come to Ireland, it's a long story. I didn't come here as a... A refugee, uh, if I had to tell you all the story, how I arrived, you would be sitting here for another hour. But basically, an uh, industrialist from England uh, found out about me and he wanted to uh, open a factory for Zip here in Ireland. And he advertised here in Ireland, he couldn't get anybody, then he advertised in England. And in his household, uh, my, my, one of my cousins walked in his household and one day she saw this uh, ad in the paper and she said to him, you know, you're going to have a competition in Ireland. And uh, because she knew her boss was a big uh, manufacturer of zip in England. And uh, he said to her, I won't, be, I won't have any competition because I put the ad in the paper. And at the time, I was studying in Germany. I was studying engineering. And I just finished uh, uh, my studies, and I was going to go back to Israel. And uh, my cousin told him, you know, I have, I have a cousin. He's an engineer. He, maybe he will be interested. 
And the next thing I got a letter from this gentleman with the airline ticket to come to London. There he has a proposition to me and he said, uh, he, he was German, uh, chap, a German Jew, and he said, uh, he wrote a letter in German to me and he said, if we do business, good. If we don't make business, don't do business, uh, you will have a holiday on you, on my account. So as a young man, I was at the time about 25, I said, well, why not to see a, a, a little bit more of the world. And I come to London and he proposed to me what he wants to do. And I come to Ireland. I had to sign a contract for three years. And during that time, I met a, a Jewish uh, girl and we fell in love and I got married and um, I'm still here. So uh, unfortunately, 12 years ago, I lost my wife. Uh, she, she had a cancer. So uh, nine years ago, I met uh, Joyce. So Joyce is now my partner. And uh, so I'm very lucky I'm not, not alone. So. I, this is my home now, and that's how I come here. Uh, Tommy, do you think that the West knew about the camps long before they, we, we believe that they did? Yeah, I, I think, I think uh, if not, not everybody, not the population, but uh, uh, the government, uh, they knew about it. And, um, you know, there is a lot. If, if a person had to start to think about how anybody could uh, help, and they didn't help during this period, <coughs> and um, Ireland hasn't got a good record either, but if, if uh, we had to start to think like this, uh, you know, you would be ha hating everybody. So you have to make peace with the past so it doesn't spoil your present. Um, yeah, that, that, that was, they knew. And especially in Germany when people are saying that they didn't know. Uh, I actually attended a lecture in the Trinity by a person that... Um, studied this subject and he said that these soldiers used to come from Poland, um, the Einsatzgruppen, the, the people that massacred, you know, hundreds of thousands. And they used to come home, especially in the rural areas. So <clears throat> they used to tell the stories and in the, the rural newspaper, they publicized what was happening, the killing was going on. Not in the official newspaper, they didn't, but um, everybody knew about it. So, um, unfortunately, it was a tragedy. I mean, I can't, uh, I don't blame the Germans. They, they couldn't do anything either at the time, because if anybody uh, showed any resistance, I mean, the uh, Nazis, just that they didn't put them on trial, they just shoot them. So, they put fear into the hearts of the people. So. They were able to get away with it that way. But uh, I'm, I'm not saying that everybody knew, but the government, they knew and they didn't try to. The, the, the biggest story is, of course, when the British, they used to go on the bombing raid uh, to Germany to bomb the uh, factories for bear, the, the engineering factory where they manufactured uh, the material for, for the weapons and everything. And sometimes they couldn't uh, bomb because the weather wasn't good, but the plane couldn't land with these bombs, so they had to discharge them. And the Jewish people, they campaigned that on the way back when they're going, they should drop them on the uh, gas chambers in Auschwitz. They knew exactly where they were. And they said, oh, we can't do it because there might be people alive. So they said, should they go into the gas chamber? They will die anyway. So they just threw this bomb in the middle of fields and they, hundreds of thousands could have been saved, but uh, nobody really made any effort. They were just interested to fight the war and the Jewish problem was left and 
Unfortunately, many millions were perished. Uh, many could have been saved. Okay, we might just have two more questions. Um, I think it's brilliant to hear a personal testimony like Tommy's, you know, and when he says as well that never again, I think that's absolutely essential as well. We can see that fascism is um, rising all around Europe and racism as well. And um, it's particularly poignant that we had um, this um, meeting here today because just 200, maybe 300 yards from here, about 10, 12 weeks ago, there was a near pogrom when racists attacked um, a local family. You know, so it's here and it's all around us. In fact, when you scratch the surface, you can hear argument. And I think it's vitally important that we understand where fascism and, and that comes from. And it comes from the way the world is organized. You know, a small elite own and control most of the world at the expense of the great majority. And when their system goes into crisis, it suits the power elite to take the heat off of them, to scapegoat and blame other people. And Tommy, and um, in relation to the last speaker or someone earlier, said, you know, what governments didn't know about this. And if you look at what happened after um, Sorry, the war. Sorry, can I ask you, if you have a question, could I ask you to ask yeah. a question? I, There's I, somebody I, down at the back. I just want to point out, though, Thank that, you. you know, the Americans, the South American governments, and that spirited away um, fascists and Nazi scientists and that sort of thing. So I, I'm, I agree with Tommy, never again, and whenever these people emerge or they arise from the sewers, we should confront them. And, um, Thankfully, the near pogrom here, there was an alternative rally okay, by trade unions and others, um, and um, that showed that we can actually um, resist. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, we take one more question down at the back. Hi, um, have you ever met a, uh, a guard from the Holocaust after the Holocaust? Have you, have you ever met? Have you ever met a guard from the Holocaust after the Holocaust? Well, <coughs> I, I, I might have, but I mean, I wouldn't have known. I wanted to meet a guard, yeah? that's what he's asking. Yeah. Uh, I, if you saw the film uh, Close to Evil, I actually wanted to meet a guard. I wanted to shake her hand, and uh, this guard, um, she was in Belgian Belsen, she's still alive, uh, living in Hamburg and uh, Hanover, but um, uh, I didn't meet her. Uh, this wasn't disappointment that I didn't meet her. What the disappointment was that uh, she was uh, not able uh, to say sorry uh, after all this time. <coughs> 70 years. I actually thought that this lady, she's 93 years old today, uh, she was a young woman at the time, about 23 years old, 20, 23 years old, when she served in, uh, in Belgian Belsen. She was indoctrinated, she was brainwashed, and she thought what she was doing was the right thing to do. Uh, but after 70 years, I thought she's a different person, and uh, that's what disappointed me, uh, that in fact she's still stuck in uh, 1945, and um, uh, that was my disappointment. I don't know if you are following the uh, press today. Uh, there is actually uh, one of uh, my, the, the film, Close to Evil, was shown in Germany, uh, two weeks ago for the first time, and one of the people there got so enraged seeing uh, this woman telling the lies that he actually filed, uh, uh, filed a complaint, and now a file was open against uh, this woman, Hilda uh, Mechnia, uh, that uh, she's denier and uh, that she participated in things that, um, so maybe there will be trial even. It's not what I wanted, but uh, for me, it's really a moral victory because she said a lot of lies and um, when we all gone, when I am gone, and nobody will be able to contradict what she said, at least now there will be a, 
a complaint and her version of event, how she described them, uh, that it was a camp, that we were criminals, and that's why we were there, that the corpses were brought into the camp, they didn't die in the camp. All this will be refuted, and for generations to come, when they will go to these archives and they will be uh, learning about the Holocaust, at least her version of event uh, will be contradicted, uh, maybe legally, and in that respect, uh, I think it's a moral victory as far as I'm concerned. Okay, we just, sorry, one last question and, and then. Uh, sorry, uh, did you ever go back to visit your father's farm after the war? Did you ever go back to visit your father's farm after the war? To where? To your father's farm. Oh yeah, sorry, okay. At some time I just can't hear it properly, yeah. We, after the war, of course, um, yeah, after the liberation, we were liberated in April, the war ended in May, and um, we didn't know about my father, and my father didn't know about me, but we were there till about end of June because they kept us in quarantine, they wouldn't let us out because there was disease, typhoid, diphtheria, tuberculosis. There are uh, contagious uh, illnesses, so they wouldn't let us out. But we left uh, about end of the June. We arrived uh, in Prague. Uh, buses came to collect us because the railway line were all bombed. And um, we still were in quarantine in Prague. Again, with, uh, they, they checked us. And from Prague, we got a couple of pounds, some money, and said, go home. And that, that's, that's how it ended. So uh, eventually, we met my father in Bratislava for the first time. It was July 1945. He didn't know anything about us. We didn't know anything about him. So we, we were reunited. And I mean, it was a miracle that we all survived. Uh, so. We came back to Slovakia, unfortunately. Slovakia was still poisoned with the propaganda. There was still anti-Jewish feeling. And when we arrived to Slovakia, as I said, out of 90,000, only 17,000 17, survived. And the Slovak people said, oh my God, more of them are coming back that were taken away. So we, we didn't feel home anymore. And uh, when the State of Israel was established, uh, in fact, uh, we emigrated, we left Slovakia, emigrated. I, was, I emigrated in February 1949 uh, to Israel, and I, about July 1949, uh, my brother and mother and father followed me as well. Okay, so we just thank Tommy one last time, and then book signing, thank you.